From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. After months of speculation, the Speaker's car tax proposal is finally out. He wants the pesky tax gone in six years' time. If passed, it will immediately be great news for people who own really old cars, and everyone will see a dip in their bill in 2017. But major questions remain, chief among them. How will the state pay the $221 million bill every year once the car tax is entirely eliminated? Our guest this week on Newsmakers, Rhode Island House Speaker Nicholas Mattiello. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my left, joining me on the program, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Mr. Speaker, welcome back to the show. It's good to have you. Nice to be here. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Let's start with the car tax, shall we? All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So your plan would eventually eliminate the car tax if passed. Um, cars older than 15 years old would be removed from the tax rolls right away. For everyone, you tackle the car tax on three fronts. How they're valued, uh, raising exemptions, and lowering car tax rates in over six years uh, these would allow, uh, all of those would grow until the car tax is gone altogether. Uh, no doubt this is music to a lot of people's ears, yes. if, if not everyone. But is it responsible to make these promises without a concrete plan that specifically spells out how to pay for it? Absolutely, absolutely. First, let me say that um, I'm, uh, I'm very pleased with the plan we put out. Uh, it, it, uh, it keeps a promise that I made, but I want, I want to be clear. I made the promise, not because it's my initiative, it's what I'm hearing from people. People absolutely want car tax relief, and they're entitled to it because we have the highest car tax in the country. It's an unfair system. When we eliminate it, Tim, we're going to be in a large group of 50% of the states. So eliminating it gets us halfway there. Uh, it doesn't put us at the, 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 the head of the line. This is just something that's blown out of proportion in the state. Each municipality does it differently. Uh, a lot of the mayors and town managers have allowed the rate to grow too much to the point that it's oppressive, regressive. People really don't like it. It's the one thing that I hear the most complain about. I've heard it for 10, 11 years consistently. In the last election, I heard it over and over and over and over again, uh, almost every day. So. From my perspective, this is the people's request. And where we get elected, elected officials get, uh, are in position to serve the interests of the people. So if the people want that, would it be anything but responsible to do? But uh, well, we, we have, we but have you, to do you it. You still have to pay for it. I mean, $221 million, uh, six years, first year, $26 million. Where's it coming from? Well, everybody asks where it's coming from. and Because and it's what, an important question. It is an important question, but we have a very large budget. So I'm, I'm not going to find it in box A and, and replace it with car tax. We, we look at the budget very comprehensively. We're looking at doing things more efficiently and better than before. We, we have very talented uh, fiscal folks in both the House, the Senate, in the administration. And we're looking to, at doing things better for, for the public. So that's for them to figure out, not for the House Speaker to figure out. You go find the money. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely not. I, I work collaterally with the people that, that actually grind the numbers and, 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 uh, and give you the runs on the policies and, and, and make the estimates. So it's a collaborative effort. It's myself, the Senate President, the, the finance chairs, our fiscal staffs, the finance committees, the administration, the, gov the governor. We, we all somehow, in, in some combination of efforts, put together a budget. And you, you, you have to this year look at everything anew. So it's not going to come out of any one box. And that, that's the question that everybody asks. Where are you going to find it? It's impossible to define where you're going to find money for anything that's already in the budget or that's suggested. But comprehensively, you put your budget together and you, do, you, you, you effectuate the people's priorities, and that's exactly what this is. If it's across the budget, though, you're going to have to look, presumably, at, at social services. That's like, I think, 40% of the budget right now. Education's probably another 30%. I mean, those are, you know, I know you said not looking at one box, but the, there's a couple boxes that are pretty big in that group, and then yes. some, you know, you, if you, you could take probably the whole DEM budget and you wouldn't be able to fix it. You are, you are correct, but just keep in mind that our budget whole right now, our deficit is $130 million. So now, I've, we, on a good day, we've got to find one, 
30, we're going to have to find 156 million. I would suggest that the difference in that is is negligible at best. Well, talking about that, you're talking there, but people might have trouble with the numbers. This is about the the narrow budget deficit for the budget year that starts July 1, which you're working on now. Yes. Um, as you're looking at that, I mean, I know you're all having discussions now about about where to trim. You're looking for ideas from the governor. I mean. Can you point to anything that you're you're looking particularly closely at, or uh, you know what what's being reviewed? Where are you going to find well, it? I, I I had meetings yesterday where we're looking at uh, changing formulas so you can maximize federal dollars and 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 try to uh, put money in different buckets so that we get more federal reimbursement. So that that would actually, if we can accomplish that, bring in more money without actually having to take it from anywhere else. But we have to look at everywhere, and I. You know, I'll be very frank. Whether it's 130 million or 156 million dollars, it's 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 going to be a different budget year than last year. That's just the reality of it. And you know, we deal with realities, and we will do the people's business and produce a responsible budget in difficult times. I prefer good times. You know, I prefer when we have more money and we could do different things. That's not this year, but we are going to get the people's business done, and we. I and we are, are there to serve the public, and the public wants this. And I, I'm, I'm getting countless emails. I'm, I'm getting uh, on the car tax. On the car tax, I, I, I'm getting people calling me, thanking me. I, I, I haven't had anyone yet call me and say, "Please don't do it." And, and I get countless. You know countless. the pushback on that, of course. You even said it on the show, and you said it in your in your statement. Um, you've been hearing it for 10, 11 years. Yes. Why did it take a decade? Uh, w what what I would say to that is everything has its time. And uh, when I first got elected speaker, uh, I've been speaker uh, three going on four years, I think. Uh, when I got elected speaker, we had to deal with some economic foundational uh, things. We we lowered the the corporate tax. We lowered the minimum corporate tax. Uh, we eliminated taxation on social security, uh, tax uh, sales tax on energy costs for non manufacturing uh, businesses. So. We had to do a lot of things to create a foundation that will sustain the state's economy and the repeal of the, the, the car tax and every other economic initiative into the future. And what I've said is we now have a much better economic foundation. We'll have our ups and downs, and this year is, is certainly not an up. And um, financially, from a revenue perspective, they're down. But I, I expect that they're going to they're gonna rebound a little next year. Our foundation is better than it has been in a long time. We are now competitive with our New England neighbors in, in all of the areas that I've mentioned. So it's the time to move on to something else. You acknowledge your car tax plan adds to the deficit, right? The deficit is a function of the budget. So we'll, we'll see when the budget comes out. $134 million deficit right now. You're proposing $26 oh, million. This year, yes. It adds to the deficit. A absolutely. Right. It, it's, it's another $26 million we have to find. But if it's a request of the people and it's something that they really want, I think that's one of the most important things in the budget. That should be almost at the front of the line. And then we do everything else around it. Just because it's coming in this year as a, you know, as a proposal to get accomplished, it's what the people want a lot more than things that have been in the budget for years. So is it primarily cuts where you see shrinking that deficit, including your car tax, or is there going to be revenue enhancement in there as well? No revenue enhancement. Okay, so we're going to, as you've used the word leaner, right? Efficient. Um, efficient. More efficient. Um, what is, name, name one area of state government on the table for you to make Rhode Island more efficient, leaner. Every area of state government. Come, right now, come, right there now. There has to be some, something on, on your mind. You, you put out a huge proposal. There's got to be one thing you point to and say, that, yep, that's where we can get some money. We're looking at the entire budget. I, the approach on the budget does not change. And let me be clear with, uh, on this. The approach on the budget does not change at all as a result of the, the car tax phase out. We have, we're starting with a $130 million budget deficit for the coming year. We have to look at all of government comprehensively. We have to look at every department. We have to look at, at uh, ways that we can maximize federal dollars. 
I'm, I'm, we're waiting upon uh, some proposals from the governor and, and as to how we can uh, maximize efficiencies within the departments. We have separation of powers, and some of this we have to get from the governor, or we'll, you know, we may be forced to make across the board cuts, which I, I would prefer we not do. It's not the best way to do it. So we're, we're, we're waiting, and hopefully we, we get some corrective actions, uh, action plans from the governor. But we're looking at all of government. And, but there are critical functions that people feel very strongly about, including myself. And we'll make sure that p folks' needs, people's needs, are protected as we move forward. But Any chance uh, the governor's free tuition plan or some version of it gets in the budget, it, it, it appears unlikely, especially with that deficit. Well, your question is any chance. There's, there's, uh, I, I would say <laughs> like yes to anything. There's always a chance, <laughs> right. <laughs> I, would, I would say yes to any proposal. What are the odds, maybe, then? Well, the odds of a new proposal uh, being introduced in the budget, a new program, which I would, the, the car tax is a little different. The car tax has given folks their own money back. Um, any new spending proposal this year is is very difficult to to consider or accomplish. I was I was looking at the budget documents today, and it, it, the original one, this was from January, showed that the General Assembly is seeking forty four million dollars for its expenses this year. That's up more than six million dollars versus uh, the last fiscal year, not the current one, the last one. Why is the General Assembly budget going up double digits? Uh, uh, I'd have to look at that, quite frankly. There's I, some I money. What about uh, honestly? What about that? That would on the table. Of course, it's on the table. Every Legislative grants, two, three million dollars a year on the table. Ev everything's on the table. I'm not going to say what the outcome of any one of those things are. I'm not. Uh, I don't micromanage uh, the the General Assembly, so I'll have to look at where those proposed uh, increases are coming from. And sure. So you weren't aware of no, what Ted no. just laid out. That was news. No. That's that's news to me. But I. In the budget process, we would go through, and I would ask for an explanation. And if there's a if there's a reasonable explanation, we'll consider it. If not, the, the General Assembly's budget is not gonna is is not gonna grow while everybody else does not, unless there's a particularized need that I'm unaware of right now. How so that might be a wish list, but it may not be what comes out of the budget. Mm -hmm. How close are we to seeing the budget go before House Finance? Could it be so, next week? Do you think? Probably the week after. Probably the week after that. Okay, I'll, I'll mark my calendar. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, I know you hear about this. Um, I, I believe you said uh, 220 now, 221 million dollars. That's that's it. That's the freeze where we are now. Snapshot in time. Cities and towns cannot expect more than that. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten years down the road. And we've talked to community leaders who say that's just going to make us rely on the property tax and we're going to have to lean on uh, homeowners, we're going to have to lean on businesses. If District 15 sees a property tax increase eight years from now, will you bear some responsibility for that? No, because we're, what we're going to do after the six years is we're going to tie a, a X percent of the sales tax to the number at that time. And you can't do it today because we'll have to see uh, the size of the sales tax at that point equate it uh, a the percentage that equals the 221 million dollars and and tie it to that so as the sales tax grows we're going to that that amount is going to go to the cities and towns so there there'll be a built-in escalator through so through it's not tax. frozen I, I might No it, it will not be frozen it'll it'll 221 increase 221 million could be 225 million the next year and so on and so forth if the sales tax increases absolutely so there'll be a uh, and you won't be able to predict it today but there's going to be a built-in escalator what we're trying to do is fix the car tax at the same percentage of the municipal budget that uh, that it is right now and thereafter uh, the municipalities, uh, actually all of them, are going to have to work on maintaining efficiencies. And our mayors and, and our town managers actually do a very good job on average, and, and I, I've got to commend them. And they've been great to work with on, on this car tax proposal. They've been great partners. Are you hearing any complaints from, you know, the mayor of Cumberland? I interviewed him. He wasn't psyched about it. Well, uh, you know, and, and I have a lot of respect and admiration for the mayor of, of Cumberland. And he's entitled to his viewpoint. Uh, and we, we will continue to work with them as best we can. I, quite frankly, uh, don't 100% agree, but he's, he's, got, he's got some points. I mean, it's important to me to get immediate relief this year to the taxpayers. That's, that's important to the taxpayers, therefore it's important to me. I want them to know that when the government says something, the government means it. And that's why this year is important. 
but Cumberland's tax bills went out. So I understand that that's an administrative burden on yeah. them, but uh, you know, as, as I've said previously, I think it's I think it's an okay burden. I mean, if Cumberland and or other communities are forced to give back some money to our taxpayers. It's not the ideal situation, but it's one that I can certainly live with. It's better than the other way around. Just briefly, we have to go to a break, but uh, to end the car tax conversation, we we all know last time this was tried, eventually it was reversed, and your plan would, would be fully in effect in 2023. Uh, you might not still be speaker then. Maybe you've retired, uh, moved on, whatever. Maybe you won't. I don't know. But can, how confident are you this one will stick? You know, people feel a little burned by what happened last time, I'd say, from what we hear from viewers. That's why it's going to stick. It's getting done in difficult times. This is being done because it's a priority of the people. You know, and I, I tell some of my colleagues, and by the way, my colleagues overwhelmingly support it. When we put it on the desk for signatures, the line was across the room. It was unbelievable. Uh, the, 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 the Senate is enthusiastic about it, from what I understand. It's being done in difficult times because it's a priority of the people. And what I've learned through my government service is that the people's work eventually gets done. It's getting done. Uh, because it's their priority, and I don't believe that anyone will undo it in the future. This should be at the front of the line, the front of the list of, of expenditures, not at the back. And and I'm go you know it's important to me. This this is an important th uh, priority to me, and I'm going to stick around long enough that it gets accomplished. All right, we have an important guest this week, House Speaker Nicholas Mattiello. When we come back, Paul Sox, stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back, to, welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my left, WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi, our guest this week, House Speaker Nicholas Mattiello. Um, as I said, I'd like to talk about Paw Sox now, shift gears sure. a little bit. Um, we had Larry Lucchino on Newsmakers a few weeks ago. Uh, one thing he said that's really surprised Ted and I, uh, I, I asked him if he had come to you or, or if anyone from the Paw Sox had talked to you, and he said, oh, I haven't talked to the House Speaker in months. Kind of an important person in this conversation. <laughs> um, do you think they should have come to see you? Um, I, I, I don't know in retrospect. Uh, I, I know they were dealing with the governor, the administration, the Commerce Corporation, and that was probably the right place to start. And, you know, I, I, uh, they chose to, to, to go that way, and I would, I'm, I'm fine with that. And uh, I, I think it was probably the right thing to have do. Have you talked to anyone yet? Is it, does that still hold true? Has anyone from the Paw Sox come to your office? And they have not. I have not spoken to Larry Lucchino in a very long time. Um, I, I think I ran into him at the Follies, just uh, <laughs> passing by and shaking hands. Uh, as someone reminded me the other day. Um, I, it, it's not an issue that I'm preoccupied with or working on right now. As I've indicated, a Triple-A team stadium is would be a big deal for the state. The state would would essentially become a partner, and they would, I didn't look at the specifics, but there would be a dedication of some of our revenue streams to the project. Um, I've I've always believed that in order to do something that grand, you've you've got to. You've got to start with the governor, and, and the governor would have to, you know, the, she negotiated it. Stephen Pryor, the Commerce Corporation, negotiated it. And we'll, we're looking uh, to see what foundation they've, they've laid and what their recommendation endorsement either way is. And uh, if, if it gets beyond the governor's office, then we'll, we'll consider it. But that, right now, we're, we're, we're into June. That it's didn't not seem happening. like your philosophy in 2015. You were, you were very uh, supportive of the, the plan to move the stadium when uh, the late Jim Skeff brought it up, the stadium to Providence along the 195 land, uh, and you sort of were a cheerleader on that. Uh, you weren't asking for the governor to, to come out for first and co-sign on that. So what's changed? Well, first, uh, you, you always learn as you move forward. Um, I've learned that I think the public would expect the governor to, to, to give direction and endorsement one way or another. On, on a plan like that, and the plan is different from my perspective. I thought Providence would have been great on the water. I saw it being successful. I saw it being a tool to revital, uh, revitalize Providence, help bring businesses in, uh, give collateral business. So this one doesn't charge you up as much? It does not. That Providence, I knew would have been successful. I, I, I had a gut feeling about it. I, th I thought it would be good. Pawtucket, you need a, an analysis that I don't I don't uh, intuitively uh, have, so uh, you know I leave it to the Commerce Corporation. Most 
everything starts in the administration. You know, even things that look like they start in the General Assembly, we always ask the, the Commerce Corporation and the experts over there for their opinion, and then we move on with them after they give us an opinion. So they, they negotiated it. They've, they've spent months working on it. We have not. So if they think it's a good idea, they can endorse it and give it to us and give us their foundation and say, here's why it's a good idea. And then we'll do an independent public study of it and, and we'll bring the public in and we'll, we would do hearings. If the people that have been working on it for months, if the governor who's negotiated a deal is unwilling to go forward, well, that tells me I should and the House should not even be looking at it or considering it. doesn't merit it. So, uh, the, the, to be clear, the governor needs to very clearly and formally say to you, I endorse this before anything with, you know, there's now talk of a fall session, before you would ever consider call. If, if she does that, would you definitely call a fall session? Would that just allow you to think about calling a fall session? At that point, we would, we would start to think about it. I mean, if the governor thinks that we should start to think about it, we'll start to think about it, and I don't know where that process would go. I've got I've got a leadership team to consult with. I've got colleagues in the House uh, that I, I would have to consult with, so I'm not sure. But, you know, if, if the governor doesn't endorse it uh, emphatically, uh, then I don't, I don't even have to think about it, And which is we've got a lot of business on the table. We've, we've got budget challenges. Uh, I've got a significant proposal that's very important uh, to the folks. We already talked about it, the car tax, and we, we've got a lot of work to do. This was not on my agenda. The, the administration, the governor, her people have been negotiating this, and she's not bringing us anything, so that tells me all I need to know. The Rhode Island Press Corps is not going to argue with you on this one. You have vowed to not allow the sessions to go too late mm -hmm. <laughs> at the General <laughs> Assembly. Um, but how, does you, how do you plan to implement that? and? Who gets to decide? Is that your call? No, it, it's no, it's absolutely not my call. It's my call. It's the Senate President's call, and we will communicate. We have a great relationship, uh, and and we will make uh, we will make the agreement as to what time we adjourn together. What's but what I will say, what I will say is, I have a public commitment. So, you know, I will work with the Senate President, and I'm sure we'll agree, and 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 we'll we'll get along, and and everybody will be on board. But. If there is no agreement, I've committed that we're not going to be on a certain time. So nine, ten o'clock, whatever it is, I go home. You know, because uh, the house goes home. Because what happens? And and last you know, if you, Charlie, if you go charge. home, the house goes home pretty <laughs> much. La last year, we intended to be out of there by eleven, twelve o'clock. I brought everyone in. I, I said, "Do you think we can get done?" And what does everybody want to do? I didn't make that decision by myself. But at the end of the day, five a.m., I'm on the rostrum looking out, feeling awful about it. That will not happen. I felt awful. I didn't like. The position I, I was in, nobody anticipated it. But when you start negotiating and you get beyond a certain point, there's no going back. Once you get beyond a certain point, you've got to finish or everybody will be even more angry. You threw out four times, 9, 10, 11, 12, and, and that answer. <laughs> What's too late for you? 1 a.m.? Is that when you're going to just... That's definitely too late. Midnight's okay. too late. 11 o'clock's probably too late. Uh -huh. I, I think we should, we should do our business when the public is comfortable viewing it. And... You know, certainly anything beyond 11 o'clock, they're not comfortable viewing. Might it. be fewer typos in my end of session <laughs> coverage this year. Then. Uh, thanks. Um, <laughs> so, uh, we, you were talking about the governor and the paw socks and everything. Uh, you know, uh, the constant talk at the State House right now is how frosty you and Governor Raimondo's relationship has gotten. If Alan Fung, your hometown mayor, runs against her next year, would you consider endorsing him? No, I will, do, I, will, I will endorse and support the Democratic nominee. I, I will tell you that I'm friends with Alan Fung. Uh, I think he's been a great manager for the city of Cranston. I say it all the time. I, I'm not the most political person, and, you know, and so, you know sometimes uh, when it's time to govern, you have to govern, and the governance of, of my city is very important to me, and the mayor does a great job, and I always say it. But, you know, the, the governor is the, 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 the Democratic governor of the state, and if she's the nominee, which I expect she will be, I, I will support Are her. you friends with Gina Raimondo? I, I, I would say yes. I, you know, the, the governor and myself get along just fine. We have differences as to how we govern, and, I, and what I always say is differences are good. The differences make us stronger. There's checks and balances in government. Uh, I don't think that should be a point of concern. We, we get along just fine, um, you know, but... We, we are a check on each other, and I think that's good for the people. Um, very briefly, one other important person in the world, President Trump, four months in. What do you think? 
I don't know. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, he's 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 trying to. I didn't vote for him. Let me say, let me say that. And uh, but he is the president, so I look at it a little differently than other than other folks. I I I, I don't think you resist everything that. Uh, the, the, a person from the other party that prevails does. I, I think we have to support our president. We have at least the next three or four years with them. And I'm rooting for the United States of America. So I, 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 wish, uh, I wish him well and I hope he succeeds. A lot of his proposals concern me, concern me for the state of Rhode Island. And I would imagine that there are Republican legislators and governors across the country that are very concerned. So I, I think you'll you, you'll see a lot of those po policies being ratcheted in and, and, and uh, ultimately not, not as bad as they appear right now. But I have concerns for our state. Uh, hopefully there's an economic message in there that will ultimately at some point be good for the country. But uh, we, should all be, we should all be concerned and cautious. But I root, I root for him because I root for the United States of America. House Speaker Nicholas Mattiello, thank you for joining us. If you missed any of it, it's online. For Ted Nisi, Tim White, we'll see you next week. Honey.